pray. Okay. Father, we thank you for, uh, for you, for the gift of, of Christ, for the gift of your Holy Spirit, for the gift of your salvation, for the, for the peace that comes from knowing that you are sovereign and that in this crazy world that everything is so topsy-turvy that you are, have been and always will be in control of it. And what comfort that brings, Lord, to know that, that if something happens, it's because you're allowing it and you're in full control. And so we can have peace uh, that passes all understanding because of that. And so we thank you for that too. And we thank you for this opportunity to share time together as believers, growing in our knowledge of your word and of Jesus Christ. And we pray that you'll help us grow more into the likeness of Christ through our study tonight. And we thank you for this opportunity in Jesus' name. Amen. So Psalm 35, Psalm 35, this contextually speaking, this Psalm kind of has a, um, another one of those courtroom feelings to it because David's going to be kind of presenting his case before the Lord. He's going to complain, uh, make his complaint about what's going on, and then he's going to pray to God uh, to respond to what's going on, and then after God does respond to what's going on, he praises God for his um, righteousness and that God acted. And so one of those situations. And so um, here he's being accused, he's about to be attacked, and what he's doing now is he is calling out to God. And that's one of the nice things about David is he's so, he does wear his emotions on his sleeve, so to speak, and he's very verbal and, and very good at illustrating how he's feeling and so it helps us as believers to see that like when I see Peter failing the Lord I see that and I say that's me I've failed the Lord too in spite of everything he's done for me in spite of knowing who he is I still have failed the Lord and then to see the Lord restore him so lovingly and so tenderly it's oh I need that and so it's good to see uh, those people in the Bible for all of their humanity, all their depravity, all their needs, all their worries and anxieties, and then seeing them trusting in the Lord and then seeing the faithfulness of God when people do put their faith and trust in him. Uh, so with all that said, we go to verse 1. And again, it says, of David. That's how we know this is regarding David. Verse 1 says, Contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight against those who would fight against me. Take hold of shield and buckler and rise for my help. Draw the spear and javelin against my pursuers. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. Let them be put to shame and dishonor who seek after my life. Let them be turned back and disappointed who devise evil against me. Let them be like chaff before the wind with the angel of the Lord driving them away. Let their way be dark and slippery with the angel of the Lord pursuing them. Question one asks, in verse one, David is asking the Lord to fight on his behalf. Why doesn't he just fight his own battles? And what areas of our own lives does this principle apply? First one said, contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Uh, why, why doesn't he just fight his own battles? Is he just, have you ever heard that saying before? I think it was Jesse Ventura said that, that I know, crazy to be quoting Jesse Ventura in a Bible study, but I'm pretty sure it was him, wasn't it, who said that religion and, and is just a crutch for the weak. And so in that same kind of context or thinking, if religion or seeking God is just a crutch for the weak, well, why doesn't David just fight on his own behalf? Why doesn't he just, you know, gird his loins and go and beat these guys up who are giving him a hard time? Maybe because he knows God is strong and has protected him before. I think that's a great answer. Because God is strong. He has shown himself faithful to protect him in the past. Yes. Who better to beseech for help? Yeah, I'd want God on my side. Though. Well, you can't find any of those. <laughs> yeah, and, and perhaps there is a little bit of humility involved as well. That, that uh, I am weak, yet God is strong. Um, there's another angle to this as well, and it comes from the words that are being used in the verse, and contend or fight. Um, when somebody says contend or fight, the Hebrew word that's used there is usually involved in legal disputes. So the word for contend in Hebrew in verse 1 
is the word that's used for a legal dispute. And so this gives us an additional context, making it even clearer why David would go to God and not just fight his own battles. Everything we've said so far about it is true. But think of it this way as well, that David is, is the, he's the, he's going to the judge instead of being his own judge. He's going to the judge of judges, the, the greatest judge of all. He's going to God. He's bringing his case to God instead of taking vengeance himself, instead of, of doing anything himself or making himself the judge, he's going to God to be able to um, bring this dispute to him and have it resolved justly and righteously because God has always shown himself faithful to defend him. So that's another context to take it in as well. And that's a, a good response for, um, for when we ourselves are in disputes. Why don't I take this person to court? Well, because I'm going to put it in the hands of the Lord. The Lord will judge him. The Lord will judge her. Uh, vengeance is his, saith the Lord. So I, I don't need to, to worry about that. I know God will, will sort all things out. I know God will defend me in my innocence. And I know that God will properly deal with this situation, whatever the dispute might be. If I, the simple fact of the matter is, if I biblically follow what God has laid out on to how to deal with this particular dispute, I can rest knowing that God will deal with the results. Maybe not right away, but definitely at some point, <laughs> he will deal with all those things and clear uh, my name, even if it's at the throne of judgment, even if I have to wait that long. You know what I think of often, and this kind of reminds me of that too, like, you're, and you'll know the scripture, but of course I don't, where you are, you're in the presence of God and being glorified, but you're relying on God. You're still concerned that God is, applies his justice or judgment to those mm -hmm. who have wronged you. Yeah. And I, you know, I remember when I first heard that, and I thought, why are you even, th you know, thinking about that? We, you know, we talked about that but you know the as as things in this world get darker and darker I find myself saying Lord please judge them harshly mm -hmm. you know for you know for what they're doing and all that mm -hmm. so it's kind of that reminded me of that yeah. too so many times there there are dual truths at work with the Lord right we've said it before like you know God is love and mercy, but he is also just and righteous. Um, who wrote Romans? Well, Paul wrote Romans and the Lord breathed out Romans. So both are true. There's a duality of truth. Yeah. Um, you know, God, does God hate sinners? Yes. But at the same time, he shows love to, to the sinner as well when he saves them. And so you have all this duality. And he even shows grace un, unnecessarily to sinners that he's not going to save. He gives a general grace to. And so, but then he also has a special grace that he gives to those whom he will save. And so there's all this duality going on. And I think that's another example of it. That, that at the same time I can be saying, Lord, bring your judgment and bring your justice to this situation or to this world. But at the same time, on the, the other hand, I'm also saying, but those whom you choose to save, you know, I will rejoice that you have saved them, even if they were the, one of the wicked ones who personally hurt me, because you will have mercy on whom you will have mercy. And so, and I didn't deserve to be saved, and, and so if I didn't deserve to be saved, yet he saved me, and I would want others to rejoice in that, well, then I need to be forgiving as God has forgave me in the same situation as somebody else. And I don't think that those are opposed to one another, they, they work in conjunction when you have a righteous God who's also loving and merciful and gracious. He's, a, he's both of those things. He's, he's both sides of the coin. So yeah, that's an interesting point to say that. It's, it, it's, and I think sometimes, I think we asked that in one of the Bible studies at the beginning was, is it okay for, for David to say, Lord, punish the wicked? Lord, you know, or is he, should he be more forgiving? And you know, this speaks to that. Yeah, it, yeah we, we forgive, but we're not the judge. 
you know, the Lord is. Even when we judge people like in Matthew 7, 1, it says, judge not lest ye be judged. Jesus is speaking about don't judge people hypocritically. And so he, he never says don't judge uh, within the church using God's word. That's what you're supposed to do. And so, but at the same time, God's the one who breathed out that word, so it's his judgment that's being executed when we refer to his word and say, well, this person's in uh, fellowship with God, this person's out of fellowship with God. It's not us saying that, it's God's word saying that. It's where the authority lies. Good thoughts, guys. Question two, what imagery does David use in verses two and three? Take hold of shield and buckler and rise for my help. Draw the spear and javelin against my pursuers. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. What kind of imagery does that throw into your mind as we read those verses two and three? It's protecting him. Yeah. yeah. He's fighting for him. Fighting warfare. Yeah. That this is, this is David crying out to God to take action. Like in warfare, you know, take, take serious action, take hold of the shield. And this would be not just some small shield, but a, a large full body shield that would cover the entire person. Rise up and help me. Again, every time you see uh, rise up and help, it's in the same uh, vein as rise up for battle. Um, draw the spear and the javelin against my pursuers. And then say to my soul, I am your salvation. So you can almost imagine all these enemies pursuing David, and then the imagery here is David crying out to God to rise up from his throne in, <laughs> in battle armament and d you know, like having David run behind the leg of his dad, so to speak, and be like, you know, Dad, these guys are chasing me. These guys are accusing me falsely. These guys are saying they want to kill me. And then, you know, the father standing up in all of his glory, the Lord of hosts with shield and spear and javelin. And then he says, don't worry, son, I am your salvation. I will defend you and save you. That's pretty powerful imagery. That's one of the reasons why I love the Psalms, because David uses, and other psalmists use vivid imagery like that, which helps us to kind of, because I felt that way too about that before, where it's like, man, I'm just going to run to God and cling to him and ask that he would defend me and help me because this situation or these people are beyond me. I can't can't do it. What about question three? What reassurance does David ask for at the end of verse three? At the end of verse three, it says, say to my soul, I am your salvation. What's the, what's the reassurance that he's asking for there? That's what he's looking for. The same imagery, right? He's running to the Father. Save me. What kind of reassurance is he looking for? If, he's say, if he runs to the Father and he says, uh, father, Father, save me, save me. He's looking for the reassurance of his father that his father will save, save him. Yeah, reassurance. Mm -hmm. That reassurance of his salvation or his saving. And this goes to show that we need that. That you, I mean, every believer at multiple times within their walk will need the reassurance of God's forgiveness. His grace, his mercy, his salvation, the assurance of their salvation, the security that's provided by God in our salvation, we're going to need that all the time. All the time. That's, that's why you see, like in uh, 1 Thessalonians and elsewhere, you know, uh, encourage one another with these words, right? The, the apostles say that frequently. Encourage one another with these words because they know that as believers, as we're suffering per persecution and as we're uh, walking with the Lord, it will not be easy. Uh, anyone who seeks to live a godly life will suffer persecution. And so we know this, and so we encourage. We are encouraged by these things, even though you know it, right? David knew that the Lord was going to save him, but sometimes you need to reread it or be reassured of it. Or having a friend come by, a special friend come by and reassure you with you know, something that you already knew. But saying it to you again and reminding you of it has that special... Uh, ability to reassure and encourage us. What about question four? What is David really praying for in verse four? Verse four says, Let them be put to shame and dishonor who seek after my life. Let them be turned back and disappointed who devise evil against me. What's he asking for there? 
He's talking about his enemies. So what's he asking to happen to his enemies? That they will be shamed? Shamed. Shut down. Yep. Disappointed, humiliated because of the way that they've been treating David. that happens yeah because I mean there are times where you have seen people be convicted of what they've been doing and show repentance and then ask for forgiveness from the person that they were persecuting I would say that's probably uh, less the norm and more the exception it it seems to me that that's the case Um, but yeah I mean I I've prayed that before in some people's lives who are very close to me that that the people who are treating them harshly would be convicted by God of the way they were acting and realize the way that they were acting in some way, shape, or form, be convicted, that their conscience would be pricked by the Lord and that then that would bring about a change of action or a repentance, a change of mind, which would bring a change of, of action. But I don't, you know, that's not something that, that we can um, assume is going to happen. We can pray that it would happen and hope that it would happen. And, but it's kind of like standing on the, the edge of a knife. You don't know if it's going to tilt this way, if it's going to tilt that way. Mm-hmm. You know, we're prepared to, you know, we forgive either way yeah. because we ourselves have been forgiven, but, you know, mm-hmm. it's hard to know until... Sometimes it would be nice to hear that it happened. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that would be something, too, to encourage other believers mm-hmm. with. Yes. That, you know, if there was more people here tonight or if somebody hears that on the video later mm-hmm. and they say, hey, I had that happen, to encourage one another with those stories because it shows God's faithfulness, and that would really go a long way to um, helping us endure through those things because you say, well, there's hope, maybe it'll... I know of a story from a long time ago that someone told me of a man who... um, Similar situation. It took 55 years before the person that did the, the harming came to uh, humility and was convicted of the sin and then went to that man. And, I mean, that's a long time. But it happened, and the guy who had, that, that had gotten um, treated harshly had also been trying to give this guy the gospel the whole, all those years. And he would always just blow him off and always wanted nothing to do with it. And so, and, and you know, these kind of things... Uh, sometimes don't happen, and other times they don't. They will happen, but they don't happen in the timing that we would want. Yes. But the Lord knows, yes. and so He just tells us to endure, and you know we know how to endure. That's why we can't be alone. How can you? I mean, how can you? How can you? How can you do it? If sheep aren't meant to be solitary creatures, you're meant to be in a flock, and so. You know, and you're not meant to, sheep have to be sheared and they have to be cared for because you can't do everything for yourself by yourself. And so the, all the analogies that God gives us in Scripture for ourselves shows that we need to be in community with each other and assembling together. Yes. And it's still, I just read a report today that's, that there is still uh, 25% of churches that are completely closed and not meeting, even still after a full year, there's still 25% of churches that are not gathering. Because so of Because of COVID. But they're not gathering at all. And I read a list of, uh, another pastor had just compiled a list of complaints that had been sent to him from other um, pastors that had said, people who are coming to our church because the other churches are closed, here's the list of, of what people are telling me when they come in. So several pastors kind of all said it all to this guy, and he compiled them. And it heartbreaking, heartbreaking. It's been, a, it's been practically a year now. And most of the, a lot of the complaints were that people had not heard from their pastor or their elders or the wow. deacons for this entire time. Never Just heard like from them. Never heard from them. And then others were like, you know, I have five people who died, who, who committed suicide in my circle of friends, and it's really weighing heavily on me. 
and I have no one to fellowship with, I have no one to talk to about these things, uh, because the same churches that were closed were closing small groups and everything else, mm-hmm. so of course, too. And just to, to read, uh, I wonder if I kept that. I mean, my heart was breaking the entire time that I was reading these. I think I took a picture of them. Uh, one person wrote, I am alone. Another person wrote, I am starving physically and spiritually. Mm-hmm. Another person said, uh, my family, my wife and I are hurting. We need biblical teaching. We need to gather. Um, one person wrote and said, your teaching ministry has only been my only lifeline. Um, this has destroyed uh, the spiritual growth I was experiencing. Uh, my church's leadership doesn't recognize it. Uh, let's see, I wish. We're frustrated with our church and with the restrictions. What was the other one? Uh, pastors won't open or acknowledge that the church is a necessity. Uh, leaders won't return emails on this issue. Um, our child walked away from the church because of not meeting. I struggle with mental illness. What will I do if the church remains closed? Um, so much of that does make your stomach. Oh, yeah. Uh, I didn't realize my heart had grown so cold. Um, where I live, all the churches have bowed the knee to Caesar. Uh, knee to Caesar. I feel like an outcast in my church for saying we need to gather. Uh, I miss the fellowship and singing praises to our Lord and Savior. Uh, I feel unhappy as I am not able to communicate with anyone our deepest needs and pray for each other. I can't get to know anybody. Uh, let's see. I am saddened that our church leadership lacks courage. Uh, Here's one on the opposite side of things. Our church is so overcrowded because other churches aren't opening that uh, we don't have enough leaders to go around. Well, that's a whole other. <laughs> that's a whole other angle of it. Yeah, yeah. But isn't that heartbreaking? Just those reading those things, like, oh, it's just, it just breaks my heart to hear that stuff. But the Lord is using it. Yeah. You know that big church coming into a lot of that, that flat place. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. You think, going that way and you look to your left there's that big chapel some kind mm-hmm. of chapel thing I guess they've just really grown since like, mm-hmm. had been closed like, had been closed so newly long. Closed. Yeah. No, well no, they, no, were, they, they were they were for almost a full year they just opened uh, two, two, two weeks ago, ago? Yeah. Really? I didn't know yeah. they were mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah yeah it's rough and I, that, uh, yes. and I have a few friends who their churches are open but they don't go Mm-hmm. It, and it, you know what it is it shows I think a stunning it shows failure in many ways there's failure within the church body and there's failures within the leadership of the church body the, the church body leadership has not done a, a, a good enough job explaining and teaching why church is essential like why is it essential why must you gather why is watching it online not church you know why is that not the gathering why is it because if you don't then people if you use the same terminology all the time if i say you know join us for church on sunday facebook live um i'm not changing the verb or the verbiage at all people are going to think well it's the same thing whether i watch it at home in my pjs or whether i'm at the church but you know, to tell people, and I'm not against using Facebook Live, obviously, because we've done it. I just think it's imperative that you must stress the importance of church so that as soon as people are able, that they're able to regather again. And so, and that they also understand that, look, these temporary measures are not church. These are just, these are just band-aids. This is just salve to be able to get through. Michael, it's still better to hear your word. Yeah. On Facebook, than not to hear any. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. absolutely, and that's why we use it, and that's why we do the it. Word right when you and <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can go on there and hear all kinds of things. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. That, you know, you so or I sure would say. And yes, there's got to be. That's right. There's got to be. You know, the, there's a void there. There's an opening there for mm-hmm. people to um, to be led astray. Like there's an opportunity right now. There's an opportunity for good churches, you know, to to take some of the genuine flock away from bad churches and then there's an opportunity for um, people who are uh, not rightly handling God's word 
to be out there and, and to be drawing people in as well. So those who do rightly handle, it's up to us to work diligently to continue to, to be stri you know, stand, just keep beating the drum, keep doing the, the work, and so that there is proper teaching. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's our duty. Before I left home, I don't even know who it was, I didn't have to pay much attention, but somebody had said the spirit of Antichrist has been let loose in the world. Mm. So. Yeah, in John it's and Peter, it's, it's that um, there has always been the spirits of Antichrist, plural, but that they lead up to the genuine Antichrist, who will be far worse than all of them. But that, yeah, I would say that that's the truth, and that that that, that is just like the birth pains analogy, that those are getting worse and worse and worse. I think, you know, it is too, it's too simple to look at things and just blow it off. I've, I've had a lot of conversations in the last year where people are just kind of laissez-faire blowing it off. It's not a big deal. This isn't a big deal. Um, this stuff isn't a big deal. Well, yeah, it is. You can't, you can't say that a liquor store and an abortion clinic and a, a, a food mart and all these other places, Ollie's, all these other places, at Menards, all this, they're all open because they're essential. Yes. Right? I'm but sure but, but we're, we're not going to be open because we care for people too much. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's ridiculous. Yeah. That's ridiculous. And you're, you're, you're feeding the wrong, you know, you're feeding the wrong thing because now people look at it and say, well, I guess the church isn't essential. Whereas if you fought tooth and nail, you know, willing to go to the mat to let people know, then people say, oh, wow, it must, this must really mean something. Because mm -hmm. people are willing to fight for it and give up things and sacrifice to be able to, uh, you know, go to church. Church must be meaningful. There must be something there behind it. But nobody, it, it has not been taught very well in the church at large, mm -hmm. uh, the visible church at large. But... Uh, yeah, there is opportunity there, though. I've had lots of conversations with, with people who have, have maybe starting to see, have their eyes opened a little bit with what, what's been happening over this last year. A lot of false prophets have been exposed over the last year. You know, that's, oh, COVID, go away, right? Well, it didn't. What, okay, COVID, uh, you know, Trump is going to win the election, uh, you know, and, and all these other things. So there has been... In the spiritual sense, in the kingdom of God, God has been um, using this for His glory and His for His good mightily. It's it's those false prophets and bad churches being exposed really, really greatly, and then also the opportunity to share the gospel more easily because it's an easy in. Yeah. Remember back before COVID, you know, what's your in to sharing the gospel? You either have to dive straight in, or you have to try and find you know some way of starting a conversation with somebody. Well, now. I mean, it's easy, you know. Aren't you? Are you afraid of this whole COVID thing? Yeah, I'm terrified of it. Are you? No, no. I I don't like wearing the mask enough, but I'm not terrified of it because I'm not afraid of death. And the reason I'm not afraid of death is because I've made my peace with God. And the way I made my peace with God was I was forgiven by Him by putting my faith in Jesus Christ. Yes. Would you like to know more? I mean it. Easy, so easy. I mean, before it's like, well, this guy just said something about you know. Uh, cheating in a basketball game be like oh you know hey, uh, hey have you ever cheated in a basketball game yourself no have you ever cheated in some other way though yeah oh I know I've cheated too we're both sinners aren't we I'm sure glad that I've been saved by Jesus Christ from my sins because they are many I uh, proceed to give gospel you know I mean before it's like oh you got to find a some way and that, it's not when you do it enough it starts to become easier and easier but now it's like man the, the harvest is there. It's just all you gotta do is share the gospel. But yeah. Good so do you think the rapture is going to be soon? I will tell you we are one day closer. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. I can tell you That's that. Cool. Yeah. We are one oh, day closer. I love yeah. it because uh, John MacArthur, mm -hmm. I watched him on the rapture. Mm -hmm. And he said immediately, without warning. Yeah. Yeah. You know, no warning. And that's yeah. part of it too, so is that these things that people are blowing off yeah. are it it's it, they all, everything has a greater significance than what we are attributing it to. So when so. when people aren't going to church and churches are willingly staying closed, even though they, you know, say that Christ mm -hmm. is the most important thing, you know, that that is that has a greater impact than what people realize. 
And in the same way, you know how sometimes like you go through an experience and you look back on it years later and you realize, wow, that was a huge deal. Mm -hmm. um, or you know, you read a little story in the news about a little thing that's going on and it's just a little blurb. And then mm -hmm. two months later, it's blown up and that's the most important thing in the news and it's just everything, everything, everything. And there's a lot of spiritual slumber going on right now because you know, we are closer yeah. to Christ's return than ever before. The, the, the church here in the West has been comfortable for a long time. It's finally starting to expl yeah, experience a little bit of persecution. And it's only going to get worse. But it, exactly what MacArthur said, it's going to happen, and you will not expect it. Yes. it. You will be in the middle of making your smoothie, and you're <laughs> not thinking me. anything about it. You know, And it's going to be, bam, you're in the presence of the Lord. and it, oh. you, you're just There's no... Preparing for it, and so you. I'd you, give up my kale for him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. I'd give up kale for a lot less. Yeah. 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 What an honor. Yeah. To be in that particular body. Mm -hmm. What an honor. And, and to need to know that you know there's portions of scripture that you can read that are referring to you and me. You know, we can read back on, on what the apostles did, and we can read back to King David, and we can ring back, ring back, read back to Genesis, and these are all, you know, faithful people that God has used uh, in his redemptive plan, and we can be like, oh, what would it have been like to be there? Well, you know, when you get to heaven, they're going to be like, what was it like to be raptured, you know, because they've yeah. never gone through that. Mm -hmm. We'll be like, what was it like, Jonah, you know, yeah. and, or, you know, Noah, how, you know, what, how bad did it smell? in the ark, you know, I'm just curious. And he'll be like, well, I'll tell you how bad it smelled if you tell me what it was like to be caught up in the clouds with the Lord, you know? Right. And so, yeah, I mean. But we'll have something in common with Enoch. Yes, and, yeah. And Isaiah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'll be, it'll be a or beautiful thing. Elijah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it'll, be, it'll be a beautiful thing that we can't possibly fathom. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've always wondered, yeah. you know, I don't like the feeling of, of like, <laughs> quick ascension or quick descension, like the, the pit of your stomach. No, it's like, oh, you know, so I'm like, well, will that be present? <laughs> because if it is, I'll, for a quick second, I'll be like, Whoa, and then I'll be like, oh, you know, probably not. Yeah. Well, well, yeah, no, that's the one, that's the one. Don't. No, that's that the one ride. Cool. That's the one ride I'm willing to go on is the rapture ride. No, <laughs> okay. That'll be a... <laughs> uh, question five. What is David praying for in verses five and six? And who is he referring to in these verses? He says, let them be like chaff before the wind. With the angel of the Lord driving them away, let their uh, way be dark and slippery with the angel of the Lord pursuing them. What's he praying for there? Are you talking about the same people? Same people, yes. And the same thing, really, as in verse 4, just described in a different way. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Be blown away by the wind, you know. Let my enemies be destroyed. Quick and slippery. They're going to be blown away like chaff in the wind. Uh, let their way be darkened, so hinder their plans and hinder their way, Lord. Um, not only that, but... You're, you chase them away, destroy them, chase them away, uh, oppose them, hinder their plans, bring their plans to, to an end, make their, make their work dark and slippery. So if you're trying to escape from something uh, that's terrifying you and it's dark and slippery, it's hard to escape. Mm -hmm. And so that's what David is, is talking about here. Very much a... Um, You've noticed all through verses 2 through 6 here, there's a militaristic uh, approach here. And David was a, uh, a military man. He was a military king. And so he, it it's, makes sense that he would think this way and that he would use this kind of terminology in describing uh, or praying to the Lord to help him. Verse 7. This is kind of reason why now. Verse 7, For without cause they hid their net for me, Without cause, they dug a pit for my life. Let destruction come upon him when he does not know it. That is the opposite of the, of the rapture, right? We have uh, glorification coming upon us when we do not know it. Like, mm -hmm. And it's the opposite for the wicked. They will find destruction coming upon them uh, immediately when they do not know it. Yes. And let the net that he hid ensnare him. 
Let him fall into it to his destruction. Then my soul will rejoice in the Lord, exalting in his salvation. All my bones shall say, O Lord, who is like you? Delivering the poor from him who is too strong for him. The poor and needy from him who robs him. Malicious witnesses rise up. They ask me of things that I do not know. They repay me evil for good, and my soul is bereft. <clears throat> Question six. What does verse seven tell us about what's happening to David and the reason for his prayers? Verse seven. Uh, for without cause, they hid their net from me. Without cause, they dug a pit for my life. So what is happening to David? Why is he praying the way he's praying if we... Just go by what verse 7 says. That they weren't, um, they weren't justified in what they were doing. Yeah, and, they're, and this is, if they hid their net for him, and they dug a pit for his destruction, the idea is that they this is not, born. yeah, and this is also something that's secretly done. This is not, secretly. you know, this is not something that was, uh, this is not something that was done out in the open. Uh, here, David is innocent, and so he's looking to God to, vindicate him and he's saying there was no cause here god defend me they came after me in secret with no cause they have tried to attack me and in a in an underhanded way they didn't stand out on a field and say david you have broken our truce and we call you to account for yourself instead it was the secret hidden plan to try and take his life and catch him in a net without Cause, which is why he's praying to God and asking God, the righteous judge, to defend him and rule justly in his case, so to speak. So David was innocent. Yes, yes. And when he says, that's why it's so important um, at the beginning of verse 7, for without cause they hid their net for me. In other words, I'm innocent. And then again he says, without cause they dig a pit for me. And so the fact that he is Expressing that twice is, makes the fact that he's innocent even stronger. That he was completely innocent. He should have never been. Uh, he's on the defense for no good reason. He should have never been attacked in the first place. All this is unjustified. That's why he's appealing so strongly to the Lord. It also shows, shows a certain amount of wickedness which is why this isn't David saying, well, look, these people have a misunderstanding with me, Lord. Strike them down. <laughs> Destroy them because they stole my magnet from my refrigerator, but they say they didn't. <laughs> and it could be under my refrigerator. I haven't moved it to see. But Lord, destroy them. No, it's not some misunderstanding. This is, they are wickedly and showing their wickedness by coming after him secretly and without any cause. And so this is why David is praying and why he's praying this way. Here's an interesting question. Question seven. According to verse eight, is the destruction of the wicked that's mentioned come about by their own making or is it a punishment from God? Verse eight says, let destruction come upon him when he does not know it. The context hasn't changed, so we're talking about the same wicked people. And he says, let destruction come upon these wicked people when they do not know it. And let the net that he hid ensnare him instead. Let him fall into it to his destruction. So then the question again is, is what happens? The destruction of the wicked that's mentioned in verse 8, does that come about by their own making or is it a punishment from God? Is it self-induced, or is it a punishment from God? Or is it another option? Is it, is it self-induced, punishment from God, or both? Yeah, yeah, yeah yes. <laughs> yeah, it's both. It's both. I mean, that's what the scripture is telling us here. First off, David is asking God to let this happen which tells you immediately that this is something that a sovereign God must approve of, allow, or bring about. So that's where God's part comes into it. Plus we have much else, uh, much, many other places in Scripture where we see God punishing the wicked for their sins, right? Mm -hmm. 
And so we have that aspect of it. But then we also have these verse, the verse 8 here. Let destruction come upon him when he does not know it. Let the net that he hid ensnare himself. So this is a kind of a self-induced result. They in their wickedness laid a plan for someone who is innocent. And in their wickedness they ended up catching themselves. They were, they were punished by the very trap that they themselves set up for another. There's a, another section of scripture that we actually talked about this in, all the way back in Psalm 9. All the way back in Psalm 9, in verses 15 and 16, uh, we mentioned this too. And this is what verses 15 and 16 in Psalm 9 said. It says, The nations have sunk in the pit that they made, in the net that they hid, their own foot has been caught. The Lord has made himself known. He has executed judgment, and the wicked are snared in the work of their own hands. So that's a really good section of scripture to point out that it's both. That the wicked are um, destroyed in a sense of by their own making, but it is also a punishment of God. It's both. I love hearing all the furious writing. <laughs> I can write pretty fast. <clears throat> all right, question eight. What does verse nine mean? Verse nine says, Then my soul will rejoice in the Lord, exulting in his salvation. What's happening in that what's happening in that verse? Praise and worship. Yeah, praise and worship because of what? Because of God's Response. Yeah, and his faithful response was to deliver David. He delivered him away from these people. So David says, look, I, 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 he's promising God, I will praise you for delivering me. My soul will rejoice in you. My soul will bring forth joyous praise because of you, because you have saved me. I will exalt you or lift you up because you are my salvation. We certainly can see, um, because of the context that we're talking about here, that David is speaking of what's happening in his life. But we can see how this also parallels uh, nicely our own spiritual salvation, right? God has saved me. My soul rejoices. I'm going to exalt in him because he is my salvation. So not only is it fitting, you know, physically speaking, for what God has done for David here, but all the more so spiritually fitting for our own salvation, for spiritually speaking. All right, what about question 9? What do the different parts of verse 10 mean? Verse 10 says, All my bones shall say, O Lord, who is like you, delivering the poor from him who is too strong for him, the poor and the needy from him who robs him, what about when it says, all my bones shall say? What do you think that means? When, it, when David says, all my bones shall say, O oh Lord, who is like you? What is another way that we would be more familiar with, with saying, all my bones shall say? All my bones. Yes. Ooh, very good. <laughs> yeah. All, with all of my being. I will say, O oh Lord, who is like you? Who compares to you, God? No one. You deliver the poor from them who are too strong for him, and you deliver the needy and poor from him who robs him. This is, God is unique. God is all-powerful. He is, no one compares to God. It makes you think, uh, there was this, it was mentioned in Exodus 15 as well. Exodus 15, verse 11 says, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? It's, it's a rhetorical question. Who is like you among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds and doing one? No one's like God. And so it comes right after verse 9 where, where David's saying, My soul is going to rejoice in the Lord. My soul is going to rejoice and exult in Him because He is my salvation. My whole being is going to say, God, who is like you? No one compares to you. And then he gives additional examples because the poor uh, go to you and they're helped from them who are too strong for them. And the poor and needy are helped from him who robs them. 
You're the defender of those people. What was that verse in Exodus? Exodus 15, 11. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> Question 10. What kind of witness is being described in verse 11? Let's just answer that first. I'll read verse 11 and 12. Malicious witnesses rise up. They ask me of things I do not know, and they repay me evil for good, and my soul is bereft. So the first part of the question is, what kind of witness is being described in verse 11? False. Malicious. Yeah, false, violent, malicious. This is a false, in, uh, the, the Hebrew phrasing here is false witness. But this is also because it uses uh, malicious, there is a bad intent against them. So it's a false witness that desires a bad intent for the person that you're false witnessing against. So again, this points to what type of people these are that David is talking about. You know, this isn't just, hey, Billy says he paid me back in January for the tires I, I gave him, but he didn't. You know, and Billy's like, no, I did give you that check. Don't you remember? It's not that kind of disagreement. This is pure evil wickedness. Second part of question 10 says, how did both parties react according to verse 12? Verse 12 says, they repay me evil for good, and my soul is bereft. It's a very short verse, but it does tell us how there's two groups involved here. There's David, and then there's these, these people that are against him. And even though it's a very short verse, verse 11, it does tell us how both parties react when it says they repay me, what? Evil for evil good. good. Meaning David responded with good, and they responded with evil. I think this kind of this kind of um, this kind of questioning, this kind of hard look at this particular type of scripture can help us to have a, a more godlike view of sin. How how serious sin is. Sin gets way too much of a pass. I expect the world to give sin the pass. The church should not. The church should take it as seriously as the Lord does. And so when we slow down and read this stuff like this, it really draws out the fact of just how sinful these people are behaving. Uh, the world's doing a good job right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. There's one last part of question 10, which says, what does it mean to be bereft? Agony, pain, okay. Sad, lonely. Sad and lonely because you've been deprived or because you're lacking something that's been taken from you. So when bereavement is used here, it's talking about usually loss, mm -hmm. some kind of loss. You've been deprived of something. Something has been taken from you, so you're now sad and lonely. You can think of it like, oh, you know, so-and-so's death left me bereft. Mm -hmm. All right, verse 13. But I, when they were sick, I wore sackcloth. I afflicted myself with fasting. I prayed with head bowed on my chest. I went about as though I grieved for my friend or my brother. As one who laments his mother, I bowed down in mourning. But at my stumbling, they rejoiced and gathered. They gathered together against me. Wretches whom I did not know tore at me without ceasing. Like profane mockers at a feast, they gnash at me with their teeth. How long, O oh Lord, will you look on? Rescue me from their destruction, my precious life from the lions. I will thank you in the great congregation and the mighty throng I will praise you. Let not those rejoice over me who are wrongfully my foes. And not, not, let not those wink the eye who hate me without 
cause. There's that without cause again. Question 11. In verses 13 through 14, how does David respond to his enemy's suffering? Verses 13 and 14 says this. But I, when they were sick, I wore sackcloth. I afflicted myself with fasting. I prayed with head bowed on my chest. I went about as though I grieved for my friend or my brother. As one who laments his mother, I bowed down in mourning. So how did David respond when his enemies were suffering? Or let me rephrase that. How did David respond when the people he thought were his friends or that he thought he had um, peace with but truly were his enemies, how did he respond when they were suffering? Godly or ungodly? Godly. Godly. Prayer and fasting. Mm -hmm. He prayed for them, fasted for them, did these things in such a way as if he was doing them for a brother or a mother. So that shows you the, the, the intent there. He grieved with them. He did everything that... that you would expect a godly person to do in that situation. Why is this included? Why, why is verses 13 and 14 included here? Why, what, what, would, what do we benefit from learning this from? What does this emphasize? The very last part, of the very last two words in verse 19 is without cause. You remember how earlier we pointed out that without cause was mentioned two different times? Mm -hmm. So now we have another mention of David saying that this is happening to me without cause. So this helps emphasize the fact that David has done nothing wrong. Mm -hmm. They're coming after him without cause. He's, they're accusing me of doing things I haven't done. In fact, I did good things towards them and they're coming after me without cause. Defend me, God. I am in, I'm in the right here. I'm being falsely accused. Deliver me. O righteous judge of judges, deliver me. You know the truth. And so this is just emphasizing that these people are going after David without cause. His works have shown that they're coming after him without cause. Question 12. How did David and David's enemies respond to his suffering according to verses 15 and 16? So here's our contrast. But at my stumbling, they rejoiced and gathered. They gathered together against me. Wretches whom I did not know tore at me without ceasing. And like profane mockers at a feast, they gnash at me with their teeth. What's the, how did David's enemies respond to his suffering? He, we know how David responded by verses 13 and 14. How did, the, how did these enemies respond to his suffering? They ganged up on him. Ganged up on him. Yeah. They, well, they, they, I didn't read anything about praying. I didn't read no. anything about fasting. No. Uh, instead, they, they, they come against him and they rejoice. Instead of mourning at his suffering, they rejoice at his suffering, his stumbling. Instead of mourning, they, they surround him. They gang up on him. Absolutely. Not only that, uh, like profane mockers at a feast, they gnash at me with their teeth. They're looking to mock him and humiliate him. He says they gnash at me with their teeth. It's like uh, uh, the idea, the imagery here is like a wild animal gnawing away and chewing away at him. That's what they're like. As these people surround me, it's like being surrounded by wild animals that are trying to tear me apart. That is a gigantic contrast from the way David responded to when they were suffering. Let's do that a little bit more. Question 13. Describe the contrast between David and his enemies. What, if you had to give somebody a, a quick elevator style description of the contrast between the way David responded and the way that his enemies responded, what would you say? Of course, David acted right. Yeah. He was righteous. He was righteous. Mm -hmm. He showed care by what he did. Godly and evil. Yeah, godly and evil. Um, one showed care for the other, and the other showed a lack of care for the other. You know, the, the one in the Ten Commandments, they're split into two. You have the relationship with God is part of the Ten Commandments, and then the relationship with others is other part of the Ten Commandments. So... 
do unto others as you would have done unto yourself is part of that idea that you are going to love God, you're going to serve God, you're going to love your neighbor, you're going to serve your neighbor. They're not doing any of that. David was showing love, though. David was sharing. He was doing for others what he himself would want done. Prayer, fasting, mourning with them while they're mourning. I mean, that's what we all want our, our people that are around us to do for us. Pray with me. Mourn with me when I'm mourning. Rejoice with me when I'm rejoicing. Don't gang up on me and mock me and gather around just to try and find more opportunities to tear at me and humiliate me and mock me when I'm at my lowest. Following that idea is question 14. What request does David have for God in verse 17? He says, How long, O Lord, will you look on? Rescue me from their destruction, my precious life from the lions. That's kind of that tie-in to the, they're like vicious animals tearing at me. Rescue my life from the lions. What's David asking God to do in verse 17? Finish us. <laughs> Rescue me for sure, right? And when he says, how long, O Lord, will you look on? What's another way of, of saying that? What's he feeling? If he says that, what's he, what can we gather that he's feeling at this time? I would think somewhat desperate in the timing not that God wouldn't not that he thought that God wouldn't come you know yeah. come through for him but it's like we all we want things when we want them sure <laughs> i think you know it's a it's a sub, it's a it's a lament of how he feels yeah. he knows the truth right and we've said this before how there's subjective truth and there's objective truth god's word is objective truth never changes subjective truth well, up and down it's a roller coaster it always changes David feels like God is not responding. He's not responding fast. How much longer do I have to deal with this? How much longer before you act? Mm -hmm. But he knows he will act. Mm -hmm. So you might feel a subjective way, but the way you react should be objective. Like ideally, we feel and react objectively with the Word of God. But if you feel a certain way subjectively, you can rein that in and bring your reaction and the way you feel to heal with God's objective truth, which is what happens here. How long, O oh Lord, will you look on? He knows God's looking on. He knows it. How long will you look on? So in other words, how long do I got to go through this? Please save me. Rescue me from their destruction, my precious life from the lion. So he's, he's actually showing faith here. He's not discounting that God is, he's not saying God's ignoring him or anything. He's just saying, how much longer? If you've been through something for a long time, a long, uh, long standing injury or a really long battle with a loved one, um, uh, something that you've gone through for a long season, and there's times where you just are exasperated and you might fall on your knees or you might be sitting in the shower and say, Lord, how much longer? I don't know how much more I got in me. How much longer before you intervene and, and this ends? So that's kind of what, that's what he's feeling. That's how those words used in this verse help us know how David is feeling. It wasn't a lack of patience. I mean, it could be the, not in the sense that, uh, that you're arguing with God, mm -hmm. more of the exasperation, like I, I just, I'm, he wants, it over. he wants it over. Yeah. That's how I felt last week with the ice and the snow. Yeah, off. yeah, oh. yeah. That, yeah. How much longer, long. Lord? Mm -hmm. Melt yeah. us away here. Yeah. We're not used to having the snow and the ice stay, stay. for that long. Comes and goes. Yeah, it was a whole week. Yeah. It was long for us. We had a leak from the roof at the store because the, it's a flat roof. And it's, they don't normally when the snow comes, it goes away really quickly. Well, yes. this built up plus the ice. And so it was finding every little nook and cranny. And so... It was, it was kind of like playing whack-a-mole with the drips. Oh, like, no. what? Uh, uh, you know. <laughs> the, the pans. You wipe yeah, pans. yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, Question 15. What does David say he will do in response to God's help in verse 18? And will this be done in private or in public? Verse 18 says, I will thank you in the great congregation. and the mighty throng, I will praise you. So what does David say he will do in response to God's help in verse 18? Worship. Thank Worship. Praise. praise. Thank. 
Yep. And will this be done privately or publicly? It's done publicly. That's what it means by the great congregation and the mighty throng. He's going to publicly thank God. God, you, you, I'm going to praise you. And that's the same attitude we should have, like always willing to praise God, thank God, worship God publicly, not just privately, but publicly too. And we can glorify God that way. Question 16. What does verse 19 mean? Let not those who rejoice over me who are wrongfully my foes and that let, let not those wink the eye who hate me without cause. Uh, verse 19 is just David asking again um, those two words. God, or the, asking again God to deliver him because he's being accused without cause. That's why the wrongfully my foes. And again at the end of verse 19, they hate me without cause. So he's declaring his innocence. And he he's also uses that phrase, wink the eye. What do you think that refers to? Let not those who rejoice over me, over me. So don't let the people who are wrong and wicked have the last laugh. Lord, you have the last laugh. You, you declare the, the everything to be true and just. So you have the last laugh. And let not those wink the eye who hate me without cause. What do you think it means to wink the eye in this verse? I was excited for this one because I, I get to do a little acting. You know, what happens if you have a bunch of wicked people and they go, you know, hey, hey, that Michael guy, did you see? He stole that car. Right? Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a deceitful gesture yeah. in that context. And that's why it's said, don't let them wink the eye those people who hate me without cause, don't let them wink the eye. Don't let them say, you know, like, hey, did you see what we said actually worked? Huh. You know, give the old winky. <laughs> it actually worked. Hey, he got in trouble. Ha, ha, ha. You know, don't let that happen. Hmm. Verse 20. For they do not speak peace. Talking about the same people, the context has not changed. So, for they do not speak peace, but against those who are quiet in the land, people who are peaceful, they devise words of deceit. That's what wicked people do. They open wide their mouths against me and say, Aha! Aha! Our eyes have seen it. But you have seen, O Lord, be not silent. O Lord, be not far from me. Awake and rouse yourself for my vindication, for my cause, my God, and my Lord. Vindicate me, O Lord my God, according to your righteousness, and let them not rejoice over me. Let them not say in their hearts, Aha, our heart's desire. Let them not say, We have swallowed him up. Let them be put to shame and disappointed altogether who rejoice at my calamity. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor who magnify themselves against me. Question 17. What characteristics of David's enemies are described to us in verses 20 through 21? Will they speak... Do they speak peacefully? No. Nope. They do not speak peace. <laughs> they go after people who are peaceful. They don't speak peace. Instead, they go after people who are peaceful in the land and they devise words of deceit. Same thing they're doing against David. This is all tied together, even though the, the wording is, might be odd to us. They do not speak peace, but against those who are quiet in the land, against the, they don't speak peace, but for those who are peaceful, they stand against them and devise words of deceit, lies. Now, knowing that, in verse 21 it says, They open their mouths wide against me, and they say, Aha! Aha! Our eyes have seen it! So if they are in a courtroom-like setting and they say, David has stolen a, a town and country minivan. And, aha, <laughs> aha, we have seen it. But it's totally not true. This is what is being, yeah, this is false witness. This is false witness. It's, all, it's a taunting kind of false witness, too, because it's a, aha, aha. Because the expression of aha is a joyful one. So it's, it's, oh, I'm so excited that I get to bear false witness against him. 
It's right. They take pleasure in falsely accusing those who are at peace. So, I mean, they, they can't wait. They're, they're like, oh, I can't wait. And so finally when the judge says, what is it you accuse him of? Ah, uh-huh, uh-huh. he has stolen the town and country minivan, and I saw it. Oh, yeah, I mean, this deepens the sinfulness of it, doesn't it? It really does. Question 18, according to verse 22, is God aware of the evil and the wrongdoing that we've been reading of in Psalm 35? Verse 22 says this, You have seen, O Lord, be not silent. O Lord, be not far from me. So, has God seen all the evil and wrongdoing that's been going on? Yes. Yes. And so, yeah, he's omnipresent. He's everywhere. He is the only being in all of creation. Because he is the creator. He was never created. He always has been and he always will be. He's the only one that can claim omnipresence. And so, yeah, he's seen. He's seen all this wickedness that David's been talking about. And he's seen all the wickedness that we've had in our own lives. He sees all the wickedness that's going on right now. And he will call it to account. He will forgive that which was paid for by Christ on the cross. And the rest he will call for account. Verse, or question 19. Read verses 23 and 24. Okay. <laughs> Awake and rouse yourself for my vindication, for my cause and my God and my Lord. Vindicate me, O Lord my God, according to your righteousness, and let them not rejoice over me. After reading those verses, why is David confident that God will vindicate him? It's in verse 24. God's righteous? Yes. It says, vindicate me in verse 24. This is how David is confident that God will vindicate him. Because in verse 24, he says, vindicate me, O Lord, my God, according to your righteousness. So because God is righteous, he's going to act to vindicate the innocent. And he will judge the guilty. That is really good for us to know. God is righteous. He will vindicate the the innocent. And he will punish the guilty. the, The human legal system may not. It can make mistakes. It can fail. It cannot be just. But God is just. And he is righteous. And he is perfect. And he is everywhere. He sees it all. He knows who's truly guilty. And he knows who's truly innocent. And so David, knowing that all these things about God and knowing that God is righteous, knows that God will vindicate him because he's truly innocent. So in the end, and this is all that really matters, is that in the end, in the end, he will be vindicated because he truly is, and he'll be vindicated by God himself. So that would be the hope of anyone who's ever falsely accused, anyone who's ever falsely imprisoned, anybody who's falsely... uh, called guilty when they were really innocent, the the true hope that they hold on to is that there is a righteous judge who will act to um, vindicate the innocent and judge the guilty. You basically answered question 22. (laughs) Question 22? Yeah. (laughs) We're not there yet, Ken. I know. (laughs) You're jumping way too far ahead. Sorry, sorry. Question 20. We'll get there. We'll get there. Question 20. What will be the result of David's vindication by God according to verses 25 and 26? It's it's just the verses. So you can just underline the verses. Let them not say in their hearts, Aha, our heart's desire. Let them not be joyful. Their heart's desire was to, to bear false witness. And they joyfully did it. So let them not say. Because God will vindicate. He's not going to let them say, Aha, we've gotten our heart's desire. Also because God vindicates the innocent, he will not let them say, we have swallowed him up. So in other words, the the guilty won't win. Let them be put to, instead, let them be put to shame. Let them be disappointed altogether. Those who rejoiced at my calamity, let them be clothed with shame and dishonor who magnify themselves against me. That's the result. So if if you're ever in the position of someone who's been wrongfully accused, this would be a great verse to hold to. And be like, I know, even if the justice system fails me here, 
the perfect judge will not. And all of these things will be what happens when I am vindicated by God to the wicked who persecuted me and who false, bared false witness against me. Verse 27. Let those who delight in my righteousness... Oh, there's a change here. There's a change. Notice, we're in verse 27, we start a change. Because we're not talking about the same people anymore. This is different. Let those who delight in my righteousness shout for joy and be glad and say evermore, Great is the Lord who delights in the welfare of his servant. And then my tongue shall tell of your righteousness and of your praise all the day long. Question 21. Who is David now mentioning in verses 27 and 28? He's, talking, he's not talking about the wicked anymore, right? Because the wicked don't care about righteousness. Believers. Talking about believers, yeah. People who um, delight in his innocence. People who are like-minded to him. People who are, uh, know that God's the vindicator, that God's the judge, people who didn't, uh, those who delight in his righteousness, those who believed in David, who knew, that, who knew that he was innocent, they shout for joy, and they're glad, and they say, great is the Lord, because he has vindicated David, his servant. And because of this, David's tongue shall tell of your righteousness and your praise all the day long. So that's the second part of question 21. What does David himself do? Oh, he... His tongue shall tell of the righteousness of God and praise him all the day long. Publicly. Publicly. And it's also what he encourages these other people to do too. Hey, those of you who saw that, who knew that I was in the right all along and you're rejoicing at the righteousness of God and at the righteousness that I was declared innocent because God vindicated me, let's praise God. Let's say, great is the Lord who delights in the welfare of his servant. Let's praise him all the day long. These are, these are people who are not David's enemies. These are people who are happy to see that he's been vindicated and declared innocent. And that's how he closes the psalm. He closes the psalm by encouraging others to praise God. Praise God for his protection, for his provision, for his righteousness, for his justice. Notice many times in the Psalms you start out with a lament and then that lament, and then a prayer and then a praise. Uh, very, very, very much that similar drum beat. So finally we get to Kathy's question here. Question 22. <laughs> oh, Michael. <laughs> how, would you, how would you summarize <laughs> Psalm 35? That's a good one. Yeah, I really like that. That's better even than what I had written down. Really? I thought that's what you yeah, said. <laughs> Maybe it was. I think so. Sounds smart. Yeah. Maybe I did say it. <laughs> I'm sure. It sounds smart. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a great relief to us. And these are things we need to hear, you know, with, with all the stuff that's going on now with... Um, churches and pastors being prosecuted for having their churches open and uh, you know praising God and worshiping God and doing the work of God um, I think these these promises that we find in, in Psalm 35 can be very encouraging in that direction as well but obviously you see many many different applications can be made with this yes well, very good very good message yeah it is it is it is. And that's, isn't that funny how it always works out that way? If you just, I'm, I'm always blown away. It still, it still amazes me how regardless of where we're at in our sermons mm -hmm. and where we're at in our Bible study, it is always relevant. It always is timely and relevant to whatever's going, it always is. And so, always. It doesn't matter if it's Old Testament, New Testament, it's always, yeah. Yeah, it certainly is. You know what we need. Yeah, yeah, better than we do, yes. Amen. Well, let's close in prayer, you say. Father, we thank you uh, for the true gospel of Jesus Christ, that you granted us ears that hear and eyes that see, and that by your grace alone that we've been saved through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. And we pray for those whom we know that are close to us who are not saved, Lord, that you would grant them the same grace and salvation that you have granted us. 
that you would help them to have a, a spirit of humility and a, and a heart of contrition that desires to be made right with you, that sees their sin and sees their need for a Savior and let them, Lord, come to you as you call to them. We pray that you would do that. Father, all these things we lift up to you. We lift all our missing church members who are not feeling well or who are uh, otherwise disposed. And, and we just pray that you would take care of them all. Bring us all back together so we might worship and, and fellowship again together. In your name we pray. Amen.